good morning, Ritman Grace Brethren Church. How are we doing this morning? It's great to be here with you. My name is Clark, and I'm the pastor here. If we've never had the opportunity to meet, I'd love to meet you, and I'd love to meet your family after service. So feel free to stick around, hang out in the lobby a little bit. Love to chat with you. Uh, what a crazy past week uh, we've had in this world. We've got trains tipping over and chemicals. We have revivals happening, and it's just a lot of, a lot of events happening, right? Well, we are continuing in a series that we have been in called DNA. Uh, we started it several weeks ago, so if you missed any of the messages, uh, we're, I think we're on like week five now, so just encourage you to go to our website, uh, RittmanGrace.org. Uh, you can get all caught up with those. But basically what we said in the series is that uh, we want to look at these eight biblical values that we want our church to be defined by. And we said this about these eight core values, that we're not creating these, we're actually not making these up. We find these in Scripture. This is what God desires His church, His bride, to be known for. Uh, but to recap a little bit, here's what we've discussed so far in this series. Uh, week one, we talked about the Bible and how we value Scripture. We want to pattern our lives after what the Bible says. Uh, week two, we talked about prayer and how we value prayer. We want to be a church where Prayer is a uh, first response and not a last resort. Uh, week three, we talked about worship, how we want Sunday to shape our every day. Uh, week four, we talked about what it means to be a missional church. And then last week, if you were here, we talked all about biblical community and how we value that and how we believe that we fully embrace that discipleship happens in relationships. So again, if you missed any of those past week messages, again, I encourage you to go to RittmanGrace.org. You can access those. We'd love to serve you in that way. But today we're going to look at our next value, which is equipping. Equipping. And here's what we have to say about equipping. We believe it's not the few who do the ministry for the many, but a few who equip the many for the ministry. We believe that we are called to equip God's people to carry on the work of the ministry to which he started. So what exactly does that mean? Well, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to unpack what the Apostle Paul has to say about that. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're looking at the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And as you're turning there in your Bibles, by the way, if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the words up on the screen for you. But uh, a little bit of context and background with Ephesians. Uh, Paul, one of the most influential leaders of the early church, uh, he was a follower of Jesus and he planted churches and he shared Jesus all over the earth. Uh, he has just laid down probably one of the most epic prayers of all time at the end of chapter 3 to the, his letter to the church in Ephesus. And if you're not familiar with that, I encourage you to, to go and read that later today, uh, that prayer in Ephesians 3. Uh, but Paul is basically praying that this church would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And he's praying that they would be filled with the fullness of God, that they would know the res resurrection power of Christ in them. And then he transitions into these words in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, so hopefully you're there by now, but breaking in at verse 1, here's what the Apostle Paul says. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here, and what he's doing here, is reminding us of the circumstances that he is in as he writes this letter. As he writes this letter, Paul is a prisoner for his faith. Uh, but we see him explain to us what kind of example leaders ought to be in the church. Uh, the church instruction to the whole church is what he's giving, but leaders are examples of these things. And I think that it's significant to note that the Apostle Paul is writing from prison. Because it's not like Paul is in some uh, classroom setting where he's instructing as a professor in the classroom. No, he's exhorting them as a prisoner of war. And he's urging them not to come rescue him, but instead, 
um, what, it's not like he's saying, guys, it'd be really nice if somebody would come get me out of this horrible jail. Right? It's awful here. If someone would come get me. That's not what he says. He says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. So the first point I want to make this morning is that leaders are examples of Christ. Leaders are examples of Christ. Uh, the gospel calling, what we've been called to not only trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but we've been called to faithfully follow him to wherever he would lead us and to walk in his likeness, to walk in his footsteps. And then Paul says that living in light of the gospel means that we are to be humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. We're making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And these are attributes that should be ever growing within the body of Christ. Because these are words that describe our Savior and our King. And if we're seeking to develop leaders in the church, it must start with Christ-like character. So this is number one on the list. And now we know that there's no one that is on this planet that is perfect. Because there was only one person who was perfect. And that was Jesus. We have one perfect role model. But the rest of us fall short in many ways, unfortunately. But we grow and we become more like Christ. When that happens, we realize that leadership in the church rises and falls on the character of those men and women who serve. And maturity is something that we see displayed over the course of time. And as these attributes of Christ are manifested in the lives of uh, faithful saints, followers of Jesus, future leaders, that's what takes place. So that's the first point, that leaders are examples of Christ. We're talking about equipping, but we need to start with leadership to get to equipping. It all starts with character. Notice what Paul says next now in verse 7. It says, But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And this is why that it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Paul's point here is simply this. Jesus Christ, the King of heaven, the one who ascended and now seated on the throne is the one who distributes gifts to his church in different measures and in different varieties for his sovereign purposes. Jesus Christ came and he descended as God in the flesh. God put skin on. He became the baby in the manger that grew to be the man on the cross, Jesus Christ. Jesus dwelt among us. He came to seek and save the lost so that we would have a hope, so that we would have a future that we would be reconciled to God through the cross. He bore our sin and he took our shame and he nailed it to the tree. And then three days later, proving that he was God, that he had authority over life, had authority over death. He had authority to give eternal life. He rose from the grave. It's the good news of the gospel. He conquered the power of sin and death once and for all so that you and I could be set free and have a hope and have a future. This is good news all because of his work on our behalf. And this Jesus, the one who defeated death in our place, is the one who distributes spiritual gifts to the church. And sometimes we can look around at other people and we're tempted to think to ourselves, well, man, I wish that I had this gift that this person has, or I wish that I had his gift or her gift. And we start to question and we start to doubt. We start to complain and think, God, why didn't you give me this gift? Or why didn't you give me that gift? Why did you make me the way that I am? As if God made a mistake. The reality is this, though. Jesus Christ is the one who distributed gifts to the church, and every single body part within the church is indispensable. Let me say that again. Every single body part in the church is indispensable. If you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that means that you have something to offer this church family. You do. What only you can offer, you bring something to the table. You matter here. Your gifts, your wiring, your personality, everything works together mysteriously for the good of the upbuilding of this local church. So you just need to know that. 
And when it comes to leadership within the church, they ought to stand out in a sort of way that the body would recognize and maybe think like, wow, like I want to follow after them. They live like Jesus. They're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but there's something about them that I would follow them. And the church recognizes the character of Christ in others, and they recognize that they also have been empowered by Christ. That's our next point for this morning. Leaders are empowered by Christ. They are examples of Christ in their character, but they are also empowered by Christ in their ministry. The thing about leaders is that they have grown to understand that every body part is critical and vital. And that means leaders are going to value every single individual within the church body. And will encourage you to say, be who God has made you to be. And that's what I would say to you. Be who God has made you to be. God has brought you here for a purpose. So let's get our hands dirty in ministry for the glory of God. And that's what we see in this text, that Jesus gives gifts to his church for good. And now we see some specific gifts listed by the Apostle Paul. Notice what he says in verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And I don't think this is an exhaustive list at all, but it's a list that we need to pay attention to. He starts off with these three important words. Christ himself gave. Christ himself gave. So again, who is the one who gives gifts to the church? Jesus. And he starts with, notice, the apostles and the prophets. So let's rewind a little bit to chapter 2. Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, chapter 2. See what he says about the apostles and prophets. Verses 19 and 20. He says this, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. That's all of us. Each and every one of us, we're all members of God's household in Christ. And notice what he says next in verse 20. Built on the foundation of the, here it is, the apostles and the prophets, which Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Now, cornerstone is another sermon for another day. But, but what it means is that Jesus is the cornerstone in which everything is built. It all starts with Christ. But the apostles and the prophets laid the foundation in which the church is built. So let's look at these gifts for a minute, starting with the apostles. Notice, Christ himself gave the apostles. Let's talk about the apostles a little bit. Those are the ones that were commissioned by Christ to establish the church. So in the New Testament... There were 12 apostles, those who experienced Jesus' life and Jesus' ministry firsthand, and those who were commissioned by Jesus to go out and to establish the church. And now Paul comes along a little bit later in this story in the Bible, and, and Jesus, upon Paul's conversion, Paul is on his way to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. The Bible says that Jesus blinds him, knocks him down, reveals himself to Paul, and then Paul has been known to be the apostle to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, because Jesus specifically told him that you're going to take my good news to the Gentiles. You're going to preach to the nations. You're going to be an apostle to the world. And the apostles were those who had authority to pen Scripture. If you read the New Testament, what you discover is that the majority is written by the apostles. This is the foundation that has been laid once for all for the saints, for God's people. And the Word of God is God's authority in which He says that we are to build on. God says, I have given you this. It does not change with time. It does not change with culture. The Word of God is the foundation. And we talked all about that a few weeks ago, the Bible, the Word of God. And while the office of apostle has ceased to exist in the way that Paul referred to here, because nobody in our day and age has the authority to pen Scripture. That's one way we discern false teachings and false religions. We ask the question, do they add to what Scripture says and claim it to be the authority of God? Because if the answer is yes, run away. That's my advice to you. Run away. Because the Bible is the authority of the Lord. As we talked about a few weeks back, there's no higher authority than the word of God. So while the office of apostle that Paul's referring to in this passage has ceased, 
that's capital A apostle, if you want to write that in your notes, there are people with apostolic gifting, in other words, lowercase apostle. The word apostle in Greek simply means sent one. Therefore, in essence, we are all small letter A apostles in the sense that we are sent out by Christ into our spheres of influence to be his representatives and ministers of reconciliation. We're all sent. That's part of our identity. That's part of our commission from Christ. But today, someone today with a more specific, um, a more apostolic type of gifting has more of a pioneering type of wiring, more of a pioneering type of wiring. Those who are sent out to establish new works, church planters, missionaries, those are people with more of an apostolic type gifting where they're sent out into the world to establish new works in churches. So that's a little bit about apostles. Next is the prophets. Prophets are those who speak the truth of God, those who communicate the word in a timely manner that's appropriate to the situation, the word um, that the church might be facing. And, And like the apostles, the prophets were part of the laying of the foundation. The prophets wrote a good chunk of the scriptures that we stand upon. I like what John Stott says in his commentary. This is not in the PowerPoint, but he says this, on the foundation in which the church is being built, the prophets have no successors any more than the apostles have. For the foundation was laid and finished centuries ago, and we cannot tamper with it in any way today. So what that means is this, is that the the canon of Scripture, the 66 books of the Bible, okay, the Bible is a library of books. You have 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 books of the New Testament. These 66 books of the Bible, this is the foundation upon which we stand. We have to evaluate any other claim to truth based on what is said in these 66 books. So if someone comes to you and they say, I have a word from the Lord for you. You say, okay, and then you listen, and then you ask yourself, is what I just heard, does does that align with God's word? Was that in line with the word of God, or did that just sound like something from left field? We have to test everything on the word of God. The gift of prophecy has a specific purpose. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. So that's a good litmus test for us. Am I strengthened by this? Am I encouraged by this? Am I comforted by this? Is that in line with the Word of God? It has to be tested. The next gifting on the list is evangelists, which is alive and well until Jesus returns. Evangelists are those who can persuasively and relentlessly preach the gospel. Evangelists are those who keep the main message of salvation, the main message of their ministry. Evangelists are typically very uh, gifted in rallying the church to be heralds of the gospel, to getting people actively involved and actively sharing their faith in their different spheres of influence. They're declarers of the hope of Christ, like Billy Graham, probably the greatest evangelist of all time, preached the gospel to more people than anyone on this planet. Okay, so here's the last two, pastors and teachers. Pastors and teachers, those that are gifted in spiritual care and handling the Word of God. Uh, Pastors, or some of your translations might say shepherds, are those who genuinely care for the needs of the church. They're with you in the trenches. Uh, They go through the highs and lows of life with you. Uh, They're the people who, if you're hurting or if you're facing a challenge, you would call them because you want them by your side. Because you know that they love you, they pray for you and they care. Shepherds are those who are gifted at bringing God's word to bear in really difficult and challenging situations. Uh, They're able to regularly feed the church the word of God so that the church would grow and develop a firm foundation. Teachers are those who have the gift of taking God's word and explaining it in a way where the truth comes to life. Uh, The best teachers I've seen from my experience take complex truths and explain it in a way where we say, oh, I get it. I get it. I didn't get it, and now I get it. And now I know how to apply that. I know that the bearing that the truth has upon my life now. 
And while pastoring always includes components of teaching, I don't think that teaching always includes pastoring. There's gifted teachers who uh, you may listen to and I might listen to on a podcast, but they're not pastors always. They teach you a great deal. Seminary professors, Sunday school teachers, great teachers, great at transferring the truth and information, but not always necessarily caring for your soul in a personal sort of way. So Paul is giving us this short list of variety of gifts that God has given to the church. But notice, something is central to each one of these gifts. It's the Word of God. Within all Christian leadership, the Word of God must be central to ministry, no matter what role you play. The church is built on one man. And you know who that is? Jesus. Jesus Christ. And we are all under His authority. And God has made us all unique in order to contribute to the body of Christ. Notice what Paul says in verse 12. Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and pastors and teachers to do what? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. The third point today is leaders equip the church for ministry. Leaders equip the church for ministry. This is very important for us to understand as a church. The main work of leaders in the church is not to do the work of ministry. It's to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Believe it or not, my job is not to do ministry. As a Christian, that's my job. But, but my job as, as a pastor is to equip you to do ministry. That's the job of any leader in the church. That's what leaders do. Leaders are equippers. And Paul makes this abundantly clear to equip his people for works of service. Some of your Bible translations might say to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Why do leaders do this? So that the body of Christ may be built up. And what that means for us today is that leaders are the ones who have been raised up and are skilled at doing ministry, and now they're able to pass on what they themselves have learned. Leader's responsibility is to equip the saints to go out and to do effective ministry in the world. And it's only when the entire church family is equipped and engaged that we're built up into the body of Christ that Christ wants us to be, that we're flourishing in the world by fulfilling God's purposes. And the Apostle Paul goes on to paint a picture of what that looks like and when that's actually happening, notice in verse 13, he says, Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. So here's the deal. As leaders are effectively equipping the saints for ministry, and the body is built up, the result is that we are unified in the faith. We're all sharing and growing in the knowledge of Christ. We're maturing together in Christ. Slowly but surely, Jesus is making himself known in our midst. And this is so important, especially in the day and age that we live. What a crazy time. Because it says that if we stay in our childish ways... If we don't engage, if we don't mature, if we don't grow, that we're going to be tossed. That we're going to be blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. We're going to get off on rabbit trails, on things that are not central to the truth of the gospel. We all need to grow in discerning and maturing in the truth. And this is what it looks like when we're doing that. Notice what Paul says in verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Here's the point that Paul's getting at here. When all the body parts are equipped and all the body parts are engaged in the work of ministry, love abounds. But this love is not the love that the world says is love. It's love as Jesus defines love. It's love that is firmly rooted in the truth. It's love that is centered upon Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of the church. The model of love for all of us to follow after the one who came and gave 
everything away so that you and I could have hope, the one who gave up his very life to serve us so that we may have life in him. So for those who desire to love and lead within the church, they should focus on being ones who live in truth and show the love of Christ, which is our last point for this morning. Leaders exemplify love in the church. Leaders exemplify love in the church. When you see a leader, that should be the first thing that pops in your head. It's like, wow, they love with the love of Christ. When you see a leader, that should be the first thing that pops in your head. A great example of love that radiates the Savior. And something that I've realized over time is that leaders are not born. Leaders are developed. Leaders are not born. Leaders are developed. And just like the normal cycle of human life, when an infant is born into the world, it's a process of growing and maturing. I'm going through that process with my son right now. Just so when everyone receives Christ by faith, repentance, you start as an infant, and then you need to grow, and you need to mature, and you need to just embrace that process. Because it's okay, because we're all under grace We all stumble and we all fall. We lose our way and do childish things, but but we're called to mature. We're called to grow. Leaders should be the ones that the church sees and recognizes, wow, they've made progress. And if God has done that work in their life and matured them, maybe he could do the same thing in my life. Maybe I'm not a hopeless cause. Maybe God's not through with me yet. Maybe God could do more in and through me than I had ever thought possible. And that's 100% absolutely true. Because guess what? It's not you. It's Jesus Christ, the living God, working in and through you. And I can tell you through personal experience that God can do so much more through you than you can ever dare to imagine. And so we need to be content, but we also need to be engaged engaged in the calling to be uh, which God has called us to and be faithful to those things because that is when the body of Christ is healthy and the world will take note and see the beauty of Christ. So Ritman Grace Church, may we be the type of church where we believe that it's not the few who do the ministry for the many, but rather a few who equip the many for the ministry. We believe we're equipped to, uh, called to equip God's people to carry on the work of the ministry to which he started. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We praise you because you descended and you dwelt among us. God put skin on, became a man, lived a perfect life, died an atoning sacrificial death, and rose from the grave, conquering the power of Satan and sin and death. And Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for giving gifts to your church. We thank you for the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers. Um, And we we thank you that, that you've given this responsibility to equip your church. God, we ask that you would help us with that. Help our leadership to equip the saints for ministry. What a tough time. Uh, it is to, to lead in the year of 2023. Um, the world is, there's just one news headline after another, just so many crazy things happening, and yet we can have confidence that you're with us and that you're leading us and guiding us into truth. Lord, we ask that you would help the pastors in our community, uh, give them courage and give them wisdom, uh, give the elders, leaders of these churches in Ritman uh, just discernment as they navigate uh, through all the complexities of what's going on in our world. Lord, help our church to, to do the work of ministry to which you have called us to do. And we ask all these things in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.